I'm pretty sure that most of you guys that clicked on this video right here have obviously heard of the Chernobyl disaster of 1986. I mean, it's really hard not to have heard of it. It is truly an event that shocked the entirety of the world, and there's a lot of award-winning movies, TV shows, and even video games that depict the events of the Chernobyl disaster. But I'm pretty sure that a lot of the Westerners that are gonna watch this video actually have not heard of the fact that in the Soviet Union, 29 years before the Chernobyl disaster, there was actually another nuclear disaster that was actually pretty major as well, but for some reason, reason it doesn't really feel like it gets a lot of attention. There's really no movies or TV shows being made about it and also most Westerners probably never really heard of it. Now if you guys know your Soviet history then you probably know already what I'm talking about. I'm of course talking about the 1957 Kishtim disaster also known as the Mayak nuclear disaster. In 1957 at the Mayak nuclear facility created by the Soviet Union to produce nuclear materials for atomic weapons there was a massive explosion and a huge eruption of nuclear material which actually led to hundreds of thousands of people being affected Affected, a huge amount of territory in the middle of Russia that basically became uninhabitable and about 10,000 people that were displaced. Never heard of it? Well, I'm here to tell you guys about it. Hello Blazers, it is your boy Roman, your favorite neighborhood Russian and in today's video guys, we're gonna be talking about the Soviet nuclear disaster that you've never heard of. The 1957 Kishtim disaster. So, where did this take place? The nuclear facility Mayak was actually located in the Chelyabinsk region. Yes guys, you've heard it correct. The region of Russia where I'm from. I've already said multiple times on this channel that Chelyabinsk is essentially like kind of a cursed region. Region, you know, in Chelyabinsk we survived like a meteor that fell over our city. There's a story of like an alien baby that was found in the Chelyabinsk region, actually very close to the site of this uh, nuclear event. Maybe those things are connected, who knows. And this as well. This happened in the Chelyabinsk region too. You know, it's like the region of Russia where I'm from never gets a break, honestly. Anyway, the Mayak nuclear facility was actually built between 1945 and 1948, right after the end of the Second World War, as part of the USSR's atomic bomb project. The idea was to build a nuclear facility that would not be a nuclear power plant, but would actually be producing plutonium that could be then used for atomic weapons. Mayak was built and situated pretty close to the city known as Kishtim, and also a new city was founded to be right next to the nuclear facility, in 1945 named Chelyabinsk 40. Nowadays it's called Azorsk. And to this day actually the city is still close. Not everybody can enter it, and I've never actually been there myself. It's basically kind of the same story as when Pripyat was built to be next to the Chernobyl power plant, but it's a bit different because Azorsk, the city, is still inhabitable to this day, when, you know, Pripyat you know how that went. And you know, actually, since I'm from Chelyabinsk, I actually knew quite a bit of people that were from Azorsk, this closed city located next to this nuclear facility. Like classmates and people from my university and a couple of friends. And a couple of these people that I knew had stories to tell about the disaster, but we'll get into that a bit later in this video. So yeah, the city of Azorsk, that is still a restricted city to this day, has been created. And in 1948, the nuclear facility Mayak has officially started its operation. Now, the truth is that even before this nuclear accident happens, the Mayak facility already created a couple of problems. You understand that when nuclear energy is being produced and nuclear material is being produced, there's gonna be a lot of nuclear waste as well. And essentially for a good while, Mayak was actually dumping nuclear waste right into the river next to the uh, facility. About 3.2 million curies of radioactive waste were dumped into the nearby river Techa. Which you guys gotta understand, right? Nobody told anybody about this. And there were a lot of villages located beside this river, and people used that river to drink water from, to wash their clothes, to wash themselves, to swim, whatever. So essentially for years, people would drink and swim in a river polluted by radiation without even knowing it. So yeah, I gotta understand that this obviously had repercussions, and as a result, tens or if not hundreds of thousands of people had uh, some sort of health issues because they were exposed to radiation. In 1951, the facility realized they kind of did an oopsie, so they actually started dumping a lot of the waste into nearby lakes instead of rivers, because lakes are like not connected to anything and it's apparently more safe for the environment. <laughs> One of the biggest sites of this was actually Lake Karachai, also in the Chelyabinsk region. It was basically like a pretty tiny lake into which they dumped about 20 million curie, sorry I gotta correct myself, it was actually 120 million curie of radioactive waste, so obviously it was kind of a big deal, actually that spot became one of the most contaminated places on the entirety of the earth for at one point, and ever since then, actually only in the 1980s, they actually started burying the lake, essentially filling it, and they only officially finished it in 2015. So yeah, the lake doesn't exist anymore, it's basically like just land, but it's still a pretty radiated place. And in 1953, the nuclear facility Mayak actually decided to dump their waste a bit differently. What they did is they actually created an underground storage facility located underneath, which were basically steel tanks enclosed in a concrete base, like buried about 8 meters underground, and essentially the waste was dumped in those tanks underneath the nuclear facility, and they created like a special uh, cooling system, because obviously you can imagine that nuclear waste is pretty hot, and uh, in order to keep it safely in one place, you need to cool it. So they created a cooling system, and essentially that was that. So from 1953 to 1957, nothing 
nothing really major happens. You know, they were doing their thing, producing plutonium, but it basically all came to an end. Well, it didn't came come to an end because actually the facility is still operational today, which is also interesting, by the way, you know, we'll get to it. Anyway, on September 29th, 1957, an explosion happens at the factory. That is where the disaster started. Essentially, what happened is that there was an explosion that happens within one of these steel containers that served uh, as, you know, the sort of the storage for nuclear waste underneath the plant. And so essentially what happened is that actually one of the cooling systems that was supposed to cool these tanks failed and it was not repaired. And essentially as a result of that, the temperature started to rise, nuclear waste started evaporating and basically created an explosion. Look, I'm not going to pretend like I'm a fucking nuclear scientist over there, okay? I'm just going to give you like the most layman version of what happens. Anyway, the explosion was actually pretty big. It was about like 100 tons of TNT, equivalent to 100 tons of TNT being blown up. And apparently after this explosion, about 20 million Curie of nuclear waste, the nuclear material were released. So yeah, essentially that's what happened. Now let's talk about the aftermath. According to the eyewitnesses, after the explosion, like a huge amount of dust and smoke sort of rise into the air, very, very tall, like a kilometer high, and it was glowing. Essentially, people would describe it as like seeing the northern lights, but in, you know, the Chelyabinsk region, essentially. I mean, you guys probably get what I'm talking about. You know, if you ever watched anything about Chernobyl, how, you know, they always show that, you know, there's some sort of light above like the nuclear plants after there was, uh, after the explosion happens. I mean, I guess that's just the way radiation looks when it's erupted in huge amounts. So this is pretty much the same thing that happened here. And also what's interesting is that not a lot of people who were actually at the plants, like workers and stuff, were hurt because this happened on a Sunday. And apparently nobody actually got like hurt by the explosion itself. So yeah, now you guys might have the question. Okay, obviously the city right next to the nuclear facility, Azorsk, was probably devastated, right? Just like Pripyat now, you know, completely probably abandoned nowadays. No, it's not. The truth is that apparently the way they built this nuclear facility was uh, pretty smart. Essentially, it was built in a way that if anything ever happens, it wouldn't go towards the town of Azorsk. Like the wind rose was taken into account or whatever. So actually after the explosion and after all this nuclear waste erupted and, uh, you know, went into the atmosphere, it did not cover the city of Azorsk, which was actually right pretty much next to the uh, Mayak nuclear facility. So that is basically the reason why the city still exists today. But the truth is that it was still contaminated, especially, first of all, when they just started dealing with this and workers would arrive from the city to the station and back, they would bring a lot of the radio radioactive material with them, it would be brought up on like cars, on people's clothes and everything, and certain small areas of the city were contaminated pretty badly for a bit. And look again, getting back to the point of the fact that I had some people that I knew who were actually from the town, who had like, you know, their grandparents or their parents that lived there during this time. Look, I've never really heard much stories to be honest, and again, you know, I don't really know if we can believe or not believe this because you know this is just word of mouth but yeah this uni mate of mine told me that like his grandma remembers that during these days uh people would she, she saw like some people that she knew because it was a relatively small town and it still is she saw that like people would literally walk on the street and just drop you know probably not drop dead but sick essentially you know so yeah i've heard that uh but that's just you know maybe he was making it up i don't know <laughs> so that is not it for the aftermath of this incident there was a lot more but uh, before we get into it i would kind of just like to say that what's really interesting is that information about this disaster was actually classified by the soviet union until like 1989 and only then they actually started uh publicizing a lot of these documents and you know people sort of started realizing the full story of this disaster and in fact a lot of the uh people who were sent to the region of of Azorsk, the Chelyabinsk region, essentially, to help deal with this uh, nuclear disaster, liquidate is essentially kind of, you know, similar to Pripyat, I guess. With the Mayak disaster, a lot of these people were sent in and they were, you know, asked to sign the waiver that they're not gonna tell anybody what happened here. So it was, there was a lot of secrecy. And a lot of people in Russia had no idea about this uh, for a long time. Now we do. But also what's really, really interesting is that, you know, we can say, yeah, of course, Soviet Union has always, you know, hiding their, uh, you know, their disasters from the world or whatever, from their own people, you know, because with the Chernobyl disaster as well, for a bit of time, you know, nobody really knew the full extent of what was going on. But not only the Soviet Union was hiding this, but also the United States. There's like a bunch of journalists and researchers that said that actually the CIA knew of the Mayak disaster since like 1959, but also they did not want to even talk about it or even use it as like a weapon happen, you know, against the Soviet Union in the Cold War, like, hey, look at them, you know, they're having these horrible accidents, so we're clearly bad, you know, USA. But America did not do that to protect their own uh, nuclear industry. Because as you know, the US had some accidents of their own, there was the Three Mile Island accident, and I guess overall in the US at the time, there were a lot of talks about people like, you know, being against nuclear energy and nuclear weapons and all this stuff. So essentially, America would not even share this information so that, you know, Americans would not be like, oh, hold on, this could happen to us as well. Hey, stop. So it's pretty interesting. 
interesting, isn't it? That not only did the Soviet Union not talk about this, but also did the US, which you would think it would be beneficial for them to, you know, sort of shit on the Soviet Union here, but they didn't. Anyway, let's get back to the aftermath of the accident. Essentially, the nuclear fallout that happened from all of the all of the nuclear waste released from the factory and the radioactive cloud actually moved as far as hundreds and hundreds of kilometers. And in the end, a territory that's, you know, could be considered either like about 800 square kilometers or like 20,000 square kilometers from 8 to 20,000, essentially, depending on what is considered like, you know, a significant amount of radiation. This territory has essentially become uninhabitable. And this territory got the name of the East Ural Radioactive Trace. This area was inhabited by about 270,000 people. So yeah, obviously this territory was polluted, forests and rivers and lakes, fields and stuff became, you know, unusable. You couldn't really grow food or farm or fish or do anything on there anymore. And later this territory was turned into the East Ural Nature Reserve, which actually still exists to this day. And it's basically like a natural reserve that is fully contaminated by radiation. And it was kind of created to sort of bar off this area and, you know, make this contaminated area not, you know, dangerous for people. Because if it was just open like that, you know, a lot more people could have died as, you know, a result of being exposed to radiation and also, I don't know, picking mushrooms, I don't know, in a radiated forest. And yeah, about 10,000 people were actually evacuated from nearby villages and stuff. So as you can see on like the image of this uh, nuclear trace, a lot of the biggest cities were largely untouched. So for example, you know, Kishtim and Azorsk themselves were not touched and Chelyabinsk also, you know, my hometown was also basically untouched by this, which is good, you know. <laughs> but yeah, as far as the amount of people that were actually affected and died because of this, it's very, it's, it's all very confusing because as much information I tried to find, it's all really confusing because you gotta understand that since this was kept such a secret back then and it only became public in the, uh, almost in the 1990s, there's no like clear official records of the amount of people who died as a result. And also you gotta understand that at that, that time when people were would go to the hospital because of this, people would get cancer and stuff and you can't always tell if it's caused by radiation or not. And a lot of the deaths that happened because of this were like basically attributed to other factors and uh, you know, were basically written down differently in the records. So it's so very confusing. You gotta understand that we should probably group not only the disaster that happened, but also the years that they've been dumping the nuclear waste into rivers and lakes together. So both of those things caused a lot of deaths and harm. And I think it would not be far-fetched to say that thousands of people have died as a result of this and hundreds of thousands have been uh, injured and harmed in some way and had some health conditions because of this. So, and obviously a vast area of uh, not only the Chelyabinsk region, but also the nearby regions basically became uninhabitable. And yeah, what's interesting is that the Mayak uh, nuclear facility is still operational to this day. And right now it basically serves as a reprocessing site for spent nuclear fuel. And yeah, obviously, like I said, the cities of Kishtim and Azorsk still exist to this day. So before we round off this video, I guess one thing I wanted to say is that you guys will probably write down this in the comments saying, Roman, you should visit these areas. And look, I've been thinking about it for the longest time, honestly, right? Because obviously, since I grew up in Chelyabinsk, in the Chelyabinsk region, I've heard of this disaster ever since I was a kid. Well, the thing is, guys, is that as far as I understand, a lot of the areas that were contaminated or affected by this in any way whatsoever are closed off. They're either in that like federal reserve that's like, you know, unavailable for everybody or these areas are basically actually restricted. Like for example, Azorsk, that city, I can't go in there. So yeah, obviously, I don't want to go to restricted areas and film myself, you know, trespassing, breaking the law, and then uploading that on YouTube to incriminate myself. That would be kind of dumb, wouldn't it? So yeah, I'm actually not sure if there's any locations in our in our region that are somehow related to this disaster that are not, like, closed off. Maybe there is something. Maybe there's, like, some villages or something that are just, you know, regular villages that were kind of close to it and were affected somehow. But I'm not exactly sure. I guess I would have to do some research on that. But yeah, I'm definitely not going into any restricted areas, okay? I don't not want any problems. But yeah, guys, I guess this is going to be pretty much it for this video, though. I hope you guys did enjoy it. I think it's a really fascinating topic. I wanted to make a video about this for a while now, and I'm pretty sure that most of you guys that are gonna watch this video have probably never heard of this uh, nuclear disaster. So yeah, if you guys did enjoy today's video, then please make sure to slap the like on it. If you guys want to support me additionally, support my channel, support what I do, then go over to the link down in the description to my Patreon, donate to it. I would gladly appreciate it. Helps me out a lot. And yeah, guys, that is going to be pretty much it for today's video, and I will see you guys in the next one. Peace.